was saying I'm really impressed that this many people would turn up on a Thursday afternoon uh, after school is over and students have gone. So I look forward to a lively conversation. Um, as Marcy said, you're going to be hearing primarily about the work that I've been doing at the cross-professional teaching of practice in professional education. The other study that I'm engaged with in teacher education is a, is a very, very different kind of study. So I was telling Tom, this is kind of the inverse of the big New York study that I'm doing with four economists that's looking um, much broader brush at kind of features of teacher preparation and how they contribute to value-added student achievement and teacher retention. So that's kind of a policy-oriented study. This is a micro-study. This is sort of getting inside the teaching of practice. Um, so I've spent a lot of time thinking about teacher education from both of these angles. Um, but as somebody who teaches the English methods class and has been teaching English methods in teacher education for now a very long time, I'm very interested in this question of how we teach others complex practice. Um, I'm particularly interested in this problem of how do we teach people these practices in the context of higher education? Why do we have teacher education located at a university? Um, particularly if you, if you buy apprenticeship models of teaching. Why don't we just locate it out in the schools? Um, there's a piece called 50 Reasons Why Universities Are Terrible Places to Educate Teachers. <laughs> I recommend it to all of you. And I often give it to my students to read to just think about, so why do we have teacher education in a university? What are the things that we can do here? So again, one of the questions I'm interested in is what role can the university play in the teaching of practice? What's sort of distinctive about the university as a context for learning to teach? Another challenge facing teacher educators, which I've heard a lot about today, is the issue of time. Given very limited time, how do we use that time well? What are the things that we should really be focusing our attention on, given that we can't do everything? We know we can't do everything. So where do we focus our attention? And I'm also interested in this question of given complex practice, particularly in the context of teaching, which is very familiar to most people learning to teach. How do we help them see the different components of complex practice? Okay? How do we help them to see those and then understand what it takes to learn to do those things? Um, I've always been interested in cross-professional work because I think we learn a lot by contrast. And teacher education is a field with tunnel vision. <laughs> you know, we tend to kind of only look at ourselves. It's very sort of focused on teacher education as the problem, when really it's professional education more generally, that most professional education faces the same kind of challenges I just uh, mentioned. It's also true, though, that teaching is often compared to professions that it's not very much like. So during the 80s and early 90s, there was a lot of talk about teaching hospitals and teaching schools and teaching like medicine, teaching like law. Well, teaching isn't really like medicine or law. Um, it's not like those things in terms of its structure. It's not like those in terms of who goes into it. Um, and it's particularly not like it in the nature of the work. And so one of the things that I think if you're going to compare professions, you look at professions that have similar kinds of work or practice and therefore similar kinds of challenges in teaching those practices. So in thinking about this, we ended up choosing teaching, clinical psychology, and clergy as professions that have a great deal of overlap in the nature of the work. We, we, David Cohen calls these professions of human improvement. We're calling them relational practices because the practice itself depends on relationship. Clinical psychologists have already acknowledged that without what they call the therapeutic allowance, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what treatment you offer, nothing works, right? You've got to have that in place. You've got to have the relationship with the client or the therapy, the particular therapy doesn't matter. Um, I would argue teaching is similar. Without having a relationship with the students, it's very hard to do the work of teaching and learning. But that raises this question, how do you teach people to do the work of building relationships? How do you teach that kind of practice? Um, so we're, we also were interested in these because there's, as I said, an overlap. Preachers teach. Therapists teach, right? Teachers counsel clergy council. So there's a lot of overlap in actually in the types of courses that they're taking as well. And one of the things that's been kind of fun about this project is going into these very different contexts, going into a seminary and realizing that, wow, planning a funeral is a little bit like planning a lesson in the way they teach it. <laughs> you know? I never thought about that. I got a sermon planning workshop that was so similar to lesson planning workshops I've seen. It was really <laughs> surprising. 
so i do this work with a team. it's a terrific team, so i just want to make sure they all get credit. um most of them are my doctoral students um and we also have a clinical psychologist who's a professor at the wright institute on our group as well. mf okay, so as i said, we're talking particularly about um professions that are concerned with human growth and development as well as practices that depend on the cultivation of relationships. And I'll just tell you a little bit about the study. This is funded by the Spencer Foundation. I should always mention our funders. Um, and we have been spending a lot of time visiting sites. We visited two, two of each, essentially. We have a little more data in clergy and clinical psychology. We only selected sites that had good reputations for the teaching of practice, and we particularly looked at classes, again, that had good reputations. We're not particularly interested in talking about what's typical. We're more interested in talking about what's possible. Okay, so that drove a lot of the sampling here. Um, these are all graduate programs. So I know you do undergraduate teacher education. Most preparation for the clergy and clinical psychology are, is graduate at the graduate level. The other thing that's really distinctive, the first thing that just drove me crazy was how much time they get relative to the preparation of teachers. I don't think that preparing to be, maybe I'm wrong, preparing to be a clergy member is more difficult than preparing to be a teacher. teacher. But rabbis, for example, it takes five or six years to produce a rabbi versus maybe the one year we get in graduate teacher <laughs> education. Um, so the amount of time is, is quite different. When we went to the longer programs, we actually tried to sample across years and also talked with students across those years of the program. Um, at each site visit, we spoke with program administrators, but we're not particularly interested, unlike my other study, in sort of program structure. We're really more interested in teaching. Um, we had focus groups with students. Again, sort of they helped us identify which classes we should be going to see. We asked them about which ones had the biggest impact on their um, development as a professional in any of these areas. Um, they gave us quite specific examples about that. And then we observed at least six to eight courses per institution. Um, we did multiple site visits um, because we realized that the first visit we were just beginning to get a sense of what was going on. So we visited these sites a number of times and then have also interviewed the faculty. But the data that we're relying on most heavily and what I'll show you today are actually observations of the classes um, and particularly classes related to the teaching of practice. We didn't confine our observation to those, so we also observed classes in theology. Um, I observed a class called Beer in Theology. <laughs> um, I had to be uh, taught what a Eucharist was so I could participate appropriately in a field experience. And you know, we've done, we've sort of watched a lot of different things. But we were particularly interested in those courses that are most closely aligned with the teaching of practice. That meant things like homiletics in the teaching of uh, the clergy. Um, it meant uh, clinical interviewing and introduction to psychotherapy in, in clinical psych programs and methods classes of various kinds in teacher education. Um, we've been, you know, right now we just, we have so much data. We're sort of still kind of getting it all organized and ready for coding. But we've been focusing particularly on um, both features that we've identified that I'll talk about today of um, the pedagogical practices as well as the content of what's being taught. You know, one of the challenges of this kind of cross-professional work is trying to figure out codes that work across professions. You know, what really works and is meaningful um, when you're thinking about the preparation of clergy and the preparation of teachers. And if you get too general, it's no longer very meaningful. So we've really struggled with this issue of what's the right unit of analysis as we cut across these different professions. Um, so today what I'm going to introduce is the, the framework that we're beginning to develop. Um, some of you have read my chapter in the book Studying Teacher Education on Pedagogical Approaches in Teacher Education. And one of my frustrations with that literature, I have actually quite a few frustrations with that literature, but one of the frustrations is everything is treated as a separate thing. So there's the case study, there's the video cases in teacher education, there's micro teaching, and that's the unit of analysis. That's what people are studying. And my, my interest is in the deeper principles that underlie those different kind of approaches. What can we, how can we think about what's powerful about cases or video that goes beneath the surface of those distinctions? <coughs> 
So this framework is the one that we're currently using to describe the teaching of practice across these professional settings. Um, well, I'll talk today about representations of practice and how they matter in professional education, the notion of the decomposition of practice, approximations of practice, and then elaborations of practice. Okay? And we've seen these across all the different settings. Um, representations of practice is something that a variety of people have worked on over time. But one of the things that we began to realize is it matters how practice is represented in professional education. And there's lots of ways in which practice is represented. Okay? First of all, they're having field experiences, right? So they're out there in the field seeing a version of practice. Um, there are also lots of examples from practice in teacher education classes. For one thing, there's the instructor of the course who may or may not be a practitioner. Okay, so that's one of the things we're tracking in the study and how that matters. Um, we're also seeing lots of things like student work, videos, case studies, lots of examples of, of um, practice that are brought in for particular purposes. Then we also have stories of practice, lots of stories of practice, and lots of different people's stories of practice that get brought into the professional education classroom. One of the things that we're interested in is how those representations matter for what people are able to see about practice. Okay. So here's an example of multimedia representations of practice. So many of you are familiar probably with Magdalene and Deborah's work on multimedia representations that give you a full year of teaching in one classroom with lots of student work, still partial but more comprehensive than most records of practice that are brought into teacher education. And then the other project that I'll talk a little bit about at the end, the Quest project affiliated with the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching is also developing websites of practice for use in teacher education. Okay, so one of the questions is sort of what's available on these different records of practice? What can you see? What can you not see? What's made explicit? What's called attention to? What remains implicit? about those representations. Um, we've been drawing on Judith Warren Little's work here on the notion of face and transparency of practice and sort of what the novices are able to see from those representations as well. So we think that the representation of practice and the various ways in which practice is represented has consequences for what students are able to learn. Um, very early on, we got interested in this notion of decomposition of practice. Uh, what we mean by decomposition is the breaking of complex practice into its constituent parts. Okay, so I'll give you some examples of this from the other professions. And the purpose of the decomposition is very much around teaching and learning, right? So it's, it's uh, in some ways an artificial decomposition, but it helps people see and practice certain elements. It relies on having an underlying grammar of practice, which is one of the things I would actually argue we lack in teaching. And clinical psychology in some areas has, so it's been really an instructive difference to watch them deconstruct um, the therapeutic alliance, for example. And relies on knowing where the joints of practice are. Where would you break it up, right? What are the things that you would focus on? The purpose of decomposition, first of all, helps you identify components that are integral to practice. We were talking about this at lunch a little bit. This notion of what's really important for novices to learn, right? What are the pieces of practice we could really focus on, focus their attention on, help them see, but also help them get better at? So that we would have some sense that when they leave, this is something they really know how to do and it's consequential for teaching. Um, so let me give you some example. Okay, so first of all, decomposition provides those kind of tools for analysis of practice. So it gives you a language to talk about practice, right? We have a common vocabulary for breaking down practice. I thought I got rid of these. Um, it also develops what I'm borrowing from Reed Stevens and Rogers Hall, this notion of discipline perception. Okay, by breaking it down, you're able to sort of discipline people's perception, their ability to see practice, and having that kind of grammar helps make that more visible. Finally, and this is something that I'll show you some examples of, it can help us identify which aspects of practice you want people to practice, to use the other term, right? If what we get better at is what we practice, what is it we're asking people to practice? 
where do we have kind of opportunities for the deliberate practice in teacher education? When do we ask people to do things more than once and to refine it and get better at it over time with feedback? So um, I'm going to give you, whoop, I want to go back. I'm going to give you an example from a homiletics course in a seminary. Um, this is course is called Speech for the Preacher. So I want to call your attention to the title. It's already a decomposition, right? Because obviously preaching is only one aspect of being a clergy member. Speech is only one aspect of preaching. This was offered early on in the seminary training, and it preceded writing your own sermons. So this course focused on reading scriptural texts. This is all it focused on, reading scriptural texts. OK, so that's an interesting decomposition. This is the joint. It's different than having to compose your own. And the focus was very much on effective principles of speech. The underlying purpose is how can you read scripture in such a way that you enable the audience to feel your interpretation of the text? It's an interesting problem of practice, right? Um, and it was a group that was quite international, people from different countries, people from you know, different backgrounds. The uh, person had been trained in homiletics and speech and had a very deep disciplinary understanding of what the components of effective speech were. Um, I have never seen feedback like she gave in this class. And she would focus on you know, very small components sometimes, voice, diction, emphasis. She spent a lot of time where your eyes should be. Have you ever thought about this when you go to church? If you go to church, where your eyes should be? Because if you're speaking to God, you shouldn't be looking at the audience, you know, the, the, per, the congregation, you should be looking up somehow. She, you know, um, she really focused on these very fine details of practice. What was remarkable to me was how my own ability to watch the students in this class shifted over time after listening to her feedback. I mean, in this notion of discipline perception, she taught me how to look at the speech in a very different way. So I'm going to give you just a brief example. Um, of a snippet from this class. One of the things that she did, which was unusual, most of the time, the students got up. They all had a text. She worked on three different kinds of texts, texts that appealed to the, she had a whole different sort of whole dichotomy, a whole um, strategy for thinking about kinds of texts. Um, and she would have students, they all prepared the text. She would check how they prepared it, and then they would get up, and they would take turns reading it. And she would stop them as they read to give them feedback and really focused attention, as she said, on areas where she thought they were very close to getting it. So it was a very, even though she had no background in learning theory, it was a very nice kind of Vygotskyan notion of where you focus attention. So sometimes she spent quite a bit of time with students trying to get them to the next level. So again, the other thing is, what is everybody else learning as they're watching this? In this particular instance, she did something different. She broke up the text and everybody read a different section of it, all in a row. And then she gives some general feedback. So you'll see the general feedback she gives. And then they come up, and they do it again. Okay, She flips some of it, and they come up, and they do it again. 
Okay, so here the interesting, huh? <laughs> we were riveted by this class. We actually have a lot of videotape on this. Um, so what do we see? You know, partly again, you see this discipline, disciplining perception. She's telling you to tend to these qualities of, of speech. And over time, while she gives the majority of feedback, over time the students begin to give the feedback, um, begin to adopt her categories. Um, and she gives them, in essence, the framework for the feedback. She identifies the categories, and she's quite clear at the beginning of the course the kinds of things they're try, going to try to work on. So this was a really interesting example, not only of decomposition, but also of approximation. So I'm going to come back to this example in a minute. Another example, we saw a lot of examples of decomposition in clinical psychology. Um, we saw a variety of versions of building the therapeutic alliance. As I mentioned earlier, clinical psychologists basically, which is also facing a lot of press to become evidence-based, um, so they're facing some of the same things that teaching is, um, has concluded is that the therapeutic alliance, the mushiest part of therapy, the part they have the most difficulty measuring is actually the most important in terms of outcome that the quality of the relationship between therapist and client is, de helps determine the outcome of the treatment, no matter what kind of treatment that you're planning to use. And so again, part of, we saw a lot of attention to this, and I'll show you some examples um, of, of this effort. But we saw them also break down what it meant to build the alliance. So we saw five stages of empathy. I never thought of stages of empathy before, right? And there's strategies for establishing empathy in the relationship. We saw a sort of decomposition of how you respond to resistance. We've just finished a paper on this whole um, issue of um, responding to resistance. Because again, in all three of these professions, resistance is inevitable and often is a precursor to growth. In clinical psychology, resistance was seen as completely normal completely normal, and there was a lot of attention to given to types of resistance, so they would break down to a decomposition of types of resistance, and then also ways to respond to resistance. Um, again, I think that's a contrast to teaching, where we don't necessarily portray resistance as inevitable, even though we know it is, right? <laughs> or give those kinds of strategies for dealing with resistance. So they had examples of rolling with resistance, siding with the negative, and I discovered these work in parenting as well as <laughs> therapy. <laughs> I got to say, that's a good idea. I think I'm going to try that with my daughter. <laughs> okay. The other big category we've been spending a lot of time on is what we're calling approximations of practice. That part of what we've been seeing, again, across professional education are approximations of the practice to be learned. Um, you could argue that student teaching itself is an approximation of practice because it's not the full complexity. You don't have your own classroom. You don't teach the full day. There's a lot of ways in which it is similar to but not identical to the practice that you're trying to learn. Um, but there are lots of examples of this. So we define approximations. They're different than representations. We spend a lot of time in this issue because you actually have to do something, right? A representation you can look at. Approximation you have to take a role in. You have to do something, produce something, enact something. So we see these as opportunities to enact certain parts of the practice, where it's related to decomposition, in situations of reduced complexity. So people have made the task easier. They've reduced the complexity of the task. So simulations. Uh, in medical education, they're all going more and more to simulations. Um, for people to learn some complex things so they can practice on machines rather than people. But again, it's a, it's a, I would call that an approximation of practice. Appro approximations vary with respect to how close they are to the actual practice, and they also may distort conditions of practice. So there is a distortion involved in these approximations. That's important to attend to, I think. Um, one of the professors of clinical psychology told us, if you're learning to paddle, you wouldn't practice, practice kayaking down the rapids. You would paddle on a smooth lake to learn your strokes. Now, again, if you're in learning, you know, this is not rocket science. These are people, by and large, who don't have a background in learning or education, but they've learned the kinds of things people need. We've also borrowed here from the work of Mike Rose, who did a really nice study that I always talk about on physical therapy, on the preparation of physical therapists. And one of the things he challenges is the notion of pure apprenticeship models. Because he said there's many things that you actually can't see in a pure apprenticeship model. 
And there are instructional interventions that we do within university classes that help people see and then enact those practices. So he talks about, I'll let you read the quote. I don't need to read it to you. So these approximations represent an instructional intervention. And the purpose of the approximation is for purposes of teaching and learning. Um, we're beginning sort of to develop a typology again of different kinds of approximation that go from the least authentic to the most authentic. So again, student teaching is probably the closest approximation of practice. And there's other things where we have them um, interview a child or um, pose a problem that are further, you know, not as similar, but still along this line. Um, approximations, as I said, have this feature of enactment that's really critical, that you're actually asking people to do something. So speech for the preacher was an example of an approximation, right? People are getting up. They're doing something that is similar but not identical to what they'll do in a, in a church or um, uh, synagogue. And they are practicing, right? They're practicing one piece of the practice. So it's reduced in complexity, it's trying out that role, and it offers opportunities for them to replay their efforts. So you saw she had them do it, and then she had them do it again. And then she coaches them, and they do it multiple times. The other thing I'm going to show you a clip from is eulogy preparation, eulogy preparation in the clergy. So um, in this particular class, uh, it was, again, focused on homiletics. And it uh, talked about the different genres of things that rabbis, this is a rabbinical school, rabbis need to learn to do. And one of them was doing the eulogy. And the, the um, instructor of this course felt that eulogies were very high risk in creating rupture with your congregants. That if you got it wrong, you lost them forever. That this was not a time to make mistakes. <laughs> If there's ever a time to be listening carefully, it's preparing for a eulogy. So what he did, a really interesting approximation. He brought in a friend of his whose father had died seven years ago. Okay? But for the person, it was as if his father had just died. He still was very emotional about it. And the rabbi in front of the class, here's a representation of practice, uh, modeled the interview you would do with a grieving relative. So he modeled the kinds of questions you needed to ask in order to prepare the eulogy. You needed to learn about this person. You needed to get a sense of the facts. You needed to get a sense of what kind of person this was. So while he modeled the interview, the students were taking notes. And this is the approximation. Their task was to write the eulogy. Write the eulogy for this man's father. The instructor knew that there were predictable mistakes that students would make. He told us about them ahead of time. He said they always make these kind of mistakes. He, however, didn't warn the students about it. He didn't protect them from making the mistakes. He actually lets them make mistakes. So the clip I'm going to show you is a clip from when he's, he collects all the eulogies and he reads them. And he actually highlights error, which, again, is you know, kind of a shocking thing for us to be watching. Uh, we don't do this very much in teacher ed. But he highlights error, and part of his reason is, again, these are mistakes you don't want to make at the graveside. Better you should make them here. So let me show you the clip. So I've gone over all this. I like the opening, by the way. There's another example of a nice opening. How's the funeral feeling? I like that. I like the alliteration. I like that it's a little unexpected for the rabbi to get up and open that way. And it's like, okay, I'm with you. I'm, gonna, I'm interested in reading the next page of that story. Okay, the rabbi, you don't see um, him yet. <laughs> but now, let's go to um, let's go to where it says, as a father, Bernie was consistent. Mm -hmm. He loved each of his children. He treated each fairly, blah, blah, blah. Then you see where it says, Bernie loved to travel. And when the children were younger, they would often be found in Corona or Palm Springs. Not Corona. <laughs> <laughs> they may have been drinking Corona. Where was it? Coronado. 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 Let's go on. See where it says Bernie's education? Bernie's education took him to college and to medical school. No. He never went to medical school at that point. Osteocuts. That's right. 
Now that may seem like a small detail to you, but now you've got the family saying, you can go to medical school, and they've missed the next paragraph because you pulled them out of the experience. <clears throat> Look at the paragraph that says Bernie stopped working, but he didn't stop living, which I think is a very good. What? Where are we? Oh, Bernie Bernie stopped stopped working, oh, okay. But he didn't stop living. I think that's a very good transition sentence. But you go on where it says, in later years, the family began a new tradition of coming together each Friday evening to celebrate the Sabbath. A time Howard said, uh, that's how I would put it, where his father enjoyed just being in the presence of his wife, children, and their spouses. What's the problem? Not all of them were married. Only one of them was married. Spouse. Now you've got the other two kids thinking, <laughs> spouses. <laughs> now I bring this up, I bring this up, many of yours have these small details wrong, because it's not only names that can trip you up and pull the mourners out of the experience. It's any detail. You, you know, it's like a lawyer. Your success or failure depends on your capacity to listen with complete, not partial, not even 90%, with complete accuracy and take completely accurate notes. Okay, so again, you see an approximation and then the uses of this to focus here on error. Again, the underlying message is why, why those errors matter, that you don't want to draw people away from the experience of mourning, that you're creating, they kept talking about creating these sacred moments and you don't want to detract from it. Everything you do should be adding to that. In the same way that the Speech for the Preacher class focused very much on the reason for all of these decisions, the reason they were important is they were communicating an interpretation of the text and then enabling the congregation to enter into that text in a different way. So it wasn't that they were just focusing on technical details for the sake of technical details. It's always with the sort of underlying purpose of the practice. Um, one of the things that we're having a lot of fun with, we've seen role plays across all three professions. Um, and role plays, again, are a form of approximation, right? They, and one of the reasons that we're interested in them is that, first of all, they represent a decomposition, right? Because you have to role play something. So what is it that you're asking people to role play? Um, in my own methods class, one of the things that I ask people to role play is giving feedback to students on their writing. And it's just so interesting to me that we do it, we model it for them, right? We model good feedback, we model bad feedback, we model a variety of kinds of good feedback. And then we give them the same piece of writing and we ask them to role play with each other. And they say, oh, you know, why are you asking to do this? This is so easy. Why are we doing this? You know, give us something. I said, well, you know, trust me, let's try it with the same piece of writing first. And then we have another piece of writing we'll give you to practice on. They find it so easy challenging to then take on the role of teacher and give the feedback, even though they've seen it modeled, it's the same piece of writing, we've talked about what you could give feedback on, to then enact that role of teacher, um, it turns out to be quite challenging. Um, and they're always surprised at how much harder it is for them to do than they think it's gonna be doing. Um, it also, these role plays offer opportunities for feedback, and who gives the feedback is very important, we've discovered as well as for, we're borrowing here from Lonnie Horn's work, the notion of rehearsal and replay. Okay, so partly you can rehearse in a role play what you think you might do, right, and act it out and see what happens, but you can also replay it. And one of the things that we've seen a lot of, particularly in clinical psychology, is replays, where they say, now, let's, let's talk about what you did, just did, let's reframe it, let's try it something somewhat differently, try it again now. So they stop it and start it many times. You saw that also in the speech for the preacher when they're doing that kind of approximation. Um, one of the most characteristic pedagogies we've seen in clinical psychology is actually the videotaped role play. So student, the homework is to go home and practice various pieces of establishing empathy, for example. So it's a decomposition. They're asked to take this home. They pair up and then they take turns acting as the therapist and as the client. And then they show those videos in class. So you again have this sort of representation that's brought back into the class. And what we're interested in again is how over time when they're asked to do that 
same kind of work over time, they begin to take on the role in a different kind of way. You can begin to see the shift in how they enact that role. So here I'm going to give you an example of a role play in clinical psychology. Um, the man is serving here as the therapist and the woman as the client. And this is an example of something that you might want to practice in a setting like this before you get out into the field. Now I actually don't have any. Cool. So what's that like not having any? Never heard two people so happy to have somebody call time. He was in trouble. Right? Yeah, well, <laughs> big trouble. Um. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, at first, like, I was just, you know, I was just trying to be a little flirty, but then I was like, well, maybe I should just lay it on and see what, what he does. Um. <laughs> so, um, It, it was weird because in my mind, I was like, this is wrong. I mean, I don't know. And then I, didn't, I don't know how I would, you know, it'd be difficult to, to say, what, what do you say when something really comes on? And he didn't even touch it. I mean, he didn't, you know, I just was, I mean, you know, he said, like, is it important to you? But to me, the answer just I guess my first reaction was, besides the, the obvious flirting, was that, since it's not a real client, it was, the process felt kind of like it wasn't really flowing very well. There wasn't really much meat to kind of talk about. So just that in itself was not very authentic. But as far as when, when you started flirting, it's, you know, let me back up. When you said, I have a hard time holding on to a man, I was, I was very conscious of not kind of backing up my body language. I kind of want to stay right there. So again, you know, we see these as opportunities, first of all, for rehearsal, to take on the role, to, tr to practice it, to try it on, to see how it feels. Um, it also, again, you are able to encounter some of these challenges, the predictable challenges. This is actually one they talk a lot about in clinical psychology and warn them this is going to happen. So you need to be prepared how to deal with it when it does happen. You can see how ill-prepared he is to deal with it at the outset. Um, and how they begin to work on that over time. But again, to choose predictable but challenging problems of practice, sort of to identify those and have people have opportunities to engage in those. It's also artificial, and he picks up on the artifice of it, right? It's not the same as a client that you already have had a relationship with. It. So there's features that are different. But it's also true he doesn't in the moment know how to respond. So that's the piece that the instructor is targeting right now to focus on. And then, as I said again, in a role play, as opposed to the real classroom or the real setting, you can try it again. Right? You can get some feedback. You can try out something else. Um, the final piece of this are, are what we're calling elaborations of practice. Um, so again, it's, 
was, I mentioned the sermon planning workshop and some of these lesson planning workshops I've seen. We ask people to do very elaborated versions of practice in professional education that we don't expect them often to do out in the field. Think of our, the lesson plans we expect, the unit plans. I don't know about your students. My students do a unit plan that's this thick. And I keep telling them, you know, the point is not the product because you won't have time to develop this kind of unit plan when you're out in the classroom. I don't want you doing this when you're out in the classroom. It's a process of pedagogical thinking I'm trying to help you develop. So we're elaborating it. We're having you do lots of things and to stretch them out in ways that are not typical of the way you'll, you'll work when you're out in the field. But this is, again, for the purposes of teaching and learning. I have my students do a 15-step writing assignment in the first quarter um, where I have them really think through what are all the stages of writing, what are all the different challenges that students might encounter, and how can you provide the scaffolding for those. And I want to see it explicitly. Now, I don't think they're, they're going to do 15-stage writing assignments when they're out in the field, but it's a way of making, again, visible and elaborating and then getting them to practice that in the context of professional education. We saw this across, again, professions, where in, for example, in um, these role plays, sometimes what they'll ask the students to do in clinical psych is to transcribe the role play and then code it using the code, these decompositions of practice. This isn't something that they ask them and gloss it and do an analysis of it. This is not something they expect them to do in the field, but it's a way of, again, focusing their attention and giving them more practice in certain elements. So again, partly what we're in the process of developing, as you can see, is this framework for thinking about all of these elements involved in the teaching of practice. Um, I didn't give you very many examples from teacher education, in part because I'm assuming that teacher education is more familiar to you than these other professional education. But I'm going to give you a little example of how I've used it in my own work um, in teacher education in a moment. One of the things that struck us, though, is that unlike clinical psychology, we don't have very good frameworks for parsing teaching into its constituent parts. It's one of the reasons I actually think that ITIP, anybody remember ITIP, Instructional Theory into Practice, Hunter. Madeline Hunter, the five-step lesson plan, <laughs> why that refuses to die <laughs> is because it's one example of the decomposition of practice that has been very useful for novices, right? even though the rest of us might throw up our hands. It's there. It's, I keep running into it years after she's passed on. Um, our goal, again, is to identify principles that underlie these different kinds of specific approaches so we get a deeper understanding of what is it that we can do in the university classroom. You notice we focused mostly here in the university practice, although we've gone out into fields. We watch supervision and field experience as well as well as, again, a better understanding of what it is students are learning from these various practices. I just wanted to talk really briefly before we stop for um, uh, questions about another project that I'm involved with. This is the third <laughs> project um, called the Quest Project. And this is developing web-based multimedia representations of teaching for use in teacher education. So it, you know, one of the things that I've thought about is the ways in which it, it um, enacts many of these ideas. So um, we use the website that you saw earlier of Yvonne Devons Hutchinson, who is a very experienced English teacher in Los Angeles. And her website is a wonderful example of discussion. Discussion is probably the most core pedagogy in the teaching of literature. That's my field. It's also poorly done. Okay, and it's also difficult to teach. I've been trying to teach this for many years, and I've always found it challenging. And I've done what many other instructors have done. Part of the problem is everybody's bringing a different idea of what discussion looks like into the room. They all are in different settings. They're seeing different things. Secondly, most of what they're seeing isn't the kind of student-centered, text-based discussion that I'm trying to advocate. We all have these problems, right? We're trying to develop practices they are not necessarily seen in the field. Um, and the third thing is, discussion is one of those practices that looks deceptively easy. Right? No, nobody in the room thinks this is hard when we start out. They think, you know, what's so hard? You know, you ask questions. And they all remember their seminars in literature where they just love discussing the text, and they just know the kids are going to be so excited about discussing Romeo and Juliet that there's not much work to be done. 
So, you know, it qualifies as a, for me in the teaching of secondary English as a high leverage topic to focus attention on, right? It's something that I know they're going to have to do in the field that most people don't do well and that it has consequences for student learning, what students are able to learn from these discussions of literature. So one of the things that I did is in the initial representation, the initial website only showed the final um, year-end discussion. So it happened in May. Now, any experienced person knows that what happens in May is a function of everything else that went on in that year. Novices don't know that, right? So they look at that and they think, oh, look at that. Isn't that wonderful? That's so easy. I can do that. So when I first saw the website, I thought, you know, the representation is incomplete because it doesn't show all the work that she did early in the year to prepare teachers to engage, students to engage in this kind of discussion. So we went back and we actually added videotape from the beginning of the year when she teaches them to annotate text. She teaches them to ask questions from text. She teaches them how to disagree with each other. I mean, she actually has taught all of these features of discussion quite explicitly, and you would see none of it if you only looked at the final. She plays very little role in the final discussion. So one of the things I did is to develop an assignment for my students. This is what I call a decomposition. Breaking down the leading of discussion and preparing students for discussion into constituent parts. So part of it is establishing norms. How does she establish norms around discussion? What does classroom participation look like? How does she encourage people to participate? Who's participating? Who's not participating? Um, the role of preparing people ahead of time around the text for discussion. So I gave them, again, a set of questions with which to investigate this representation of practice. They then brought it at that after they did that, I had them do it in pairs, and then they had to lead a discussion with their peers. So they actually, now we have an approximation. <laughs> they actually had to enact a discussion. They had to lead a discussion easier with your peers than with kids, easier because you know everybody's read the text, right? So it was reduced, <laughs> reduced complexity. Um, and, but they have to practice leading a discussion, right? So they're actually now trying to do the very thing that they're studying. So I'll just show you a little bit of this one. So she's using the strategy that she's studying. I'm just curious if anyone, before we actually start talking about it, if anyone feels strongly about discussing this topic, and if you feel that you need to I'll stop there. But, you know, this was actually hard for them to do. Again, they thought it would be easy, <laughs> and it turned out to be more challenging. Um, this is just the first step, though, because obviously it's too far removed from the actual thing I want them to learn to do, which is to lead a discussion with kids. So the second part of the assignment asked them to identify something that they learned from Yvonne, the teacher. A strategy, the use of an anticipation guide, different, setting different norms for participation, making explicit norms, using sentence starters. That's one of the other things that 
Avon did was to give uh, kids ways of entering academic discourse through these various kinds of sentence starters. So I said, you know, just look through and see something that would fit within your classroom. Think through, you know, what would work. Plan for discussion and then try it. Videotape it and bring it back. So here we've got, again, another approximation, but closer to the actual practice that I want them to do. Um, and here you see a little clip, I'll just show you the beginning of it, of one of my students beginning to establish the norms for a discussion. This was the first dis whole group discussion this classroom had had. Behind her in the board you can't quite see are the sentence starters for how to disagree, how to get into the conversation. They're all listed behind her. It's okay to have silence in discussions. I know you guys, a lot of times when you're thinking, you're looking for evidence, or you're trying to figure out how to put something into words. And so silence is okay. I don't want you guys to feel uncomfortable just because nobody's talking in the room. But the important thing is that you're also thinking during silences and not just waiting for someone else to do the talking to do the So try to take that responsibility on yourself and make sure that you also are thinking while well, everyone else is looking for something to say. Um, I know some of you are really uncomfortable with talking in groups, and that's okay. And a lot of you have made an effort since the beginning of the year to talk a little bit more, and that's really great. So if you can talk, we'd love you to contribute whatever ideas you have, even if it's just reading off your paper, that's okay. And um, we're here to assess what you learn, and if you don't say anything, we don't, we don't know if you understand the story or not. So if you have questions, go ahead and ask, because that's how everyone else learns too. I'm sure a lot of people have so before we start, back. so again, what you see is her effort to now enact this, to try this out, to try to be more explicit. Because again, part of what my students believe is that you just launch into a discussion, right? And everybody will join in eventually. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of what they learn from this is, it's, as one of my students says, it's not just magic. He said, I thought it was sort of magic the way this happens. I didn't realize how much work went into this. Nobody told me you had to do all these things ahead of time. And they're beginning to learn to do that preparatory work. You know, they're still at an early stage of it. Um, and I think this enactment piece is one that we often fail to do in teacher education. That we, we have lots of approximations that have them do the planning piece. And then we do lots of things around the reflection piece. But this kind of very intentional enactment of these practices, both in the university coursework and then being able to bring those enactments back into the teacher education classroom through video is one that we, since micro-teaching in some ways, have dropped. Um, so I just wanted to give you a sense of how this could work in teacher education too and stop there and open it up for questions. Whether that is also part of teaching, um, to be that is made explicit, and whether you also think there's a difference in the other um, professions, whether it's self-selected or who goes into them, or is it something unique about education, <laughs> teachers not wanting or us not giving it? Uh, it's essential to everything you do. Yeah. So, we're actually coding for feedback. So we have whole categories of okay. feedback that we're looking at because feedback is critical. And when we saw that speech for the preacher class, I thought, wow, yeah. I don't yeah. think I've seen anything like this in teacher education. Um, it was really kind of a, uh, an eye-opener. And I think you're right. The, the cultures around critique and feedback are quite different. Um, t uh, and you could see that also in the homiletics class, that they're not afraid to identify yeah. error, right? Um, in teacher education, we seem to be afraid of addressing sure. error. We've seem to be afraid of giving negative feedback, um, even in a constructive way. And so one of our categories is affirming feedback. And there are lots of that in teacher education. Then we have corrective feedback, we have directive feedback, and we are not seeing much of that. In contrast, very much in contrast to clinical psychology. And I think they establish that. I don't think the people are very different. 
I mean, one of the reasons I think this is an interesting comparison is that similar kinds of people choose these pro three professions. And in fact, when we started this project, I was telling Rogers that the first person we interviewed was a teacher who had uh, been in uh, clinical psychology. The second person was a rabbi. Oh, I guess maybe it was a rabbi who had, who had been in a clinical psychology program. Another was a clergy member who had been a teacher. There was so much overlap um, in, the, in the professions they had considered um, that I don't think the, I don't think the people are that different. Um, they're all people who want to make a difference. You know, you can see the kinds of people that helping professions draw. But I do think the cultures are quite different. And one of the things that you see very early on in the clinical psychology work is, first of all, they're expected to be videotaping their practice and bringing it to the setting, even before they're in practice settings, right? So that's why they're doing the video <coughs> role plays, because they're not dealing with real clients yet. So from the very almost first week of class, they're asked to take on that role, videotape it, and get feedback. And they do the feedback in a variety of ways. It's both individual and group. But a lot of it is group. And you saw that in the homiletics class as well. It's group feedback, so it's public. Um, part of what we began to see is how that public feedback means other people are learning from it as well, mm -hmm. right? They're learning from the kinds of errors that other people are making. And it's often errors that they could make as well. So he, the uh, homiletics professor on the eulogy, chose errors that were characteristic. There were errors that they, lots of students made to focus in on. So yes, I think this is a critical, and one of the questions might be, how do we develop that in, within our it's culture? It's a cultural thing, but something you said earlier is also very key, which is we don't have a theory of what, what the critical components are. Right. We, the teaching is filled with blah, blah, blah about strategies, and this is, and that is, and it's a collection of stuff, but it's not tied to anything functional. Yeah, so the category, so again, this, po this problem of the categories yeah. of feedback are related to the decomposition of practice. Um, I've thought about Maggie Lampert's book on teaching mathematics as one example of a decomposition that might be quite useful. It's kind of, you know, maybe a grain size above what you actually need, but at least gives us some kind of framework. But I think it's um, something that we need, both generally, but also within domain specificity. I mean, we really need those do domain specific. So, for example, unpacking discussion. Uh, discussions of literature. Um, another thing I spend a lot of time with my students on is strategies for reading literature. Because again, most secondary English teachers think they're teaching beloved. And my job is to convince them that no, what they're really teaching are strategies for reading complex text. <laughs> and, and they're going to use those in reading beloved, but that's part of their job. Mm -hmm. And breaking down, identifying those strategies, making those strategies explicit, developing some framework, we're kind of inventing it because the field hasn't done that work yet. You have examples in elementary math yes. and reading where well, you've got them, but we don't have them across the board. Pam yes. touched on this here, but I'd be interested in sort of your responses to uh, what's different in teaching, I think, as opposed to preparing for other uh, professions is this whole idea of Lordy's idea of apprenticeship of observation. So I think, you know, the, the 14 plus years that people spend in schools who then know what it means to be a teacher after all they spent 14 years in classrooms. So I'm interested to know how that, coming up against that in the teaching profession versus, I mean, after all we have, perhaps we've done 14 years of observation of ministers and rabbis, but not quite as Not quite as many hours. <laughs> so, so I see that as different because as I was looking at these examples, I saw an openness to knowing that they didn't know. And I don't, I, I think that the one obstacle that I deal with, with a 19-year-old telling me that they do know, um, you know, and they know it in the complexity of where they are. So it's kind of walking that path of accepting where they are and getting them to be open to what they don't know. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's one way, it, clearly, in which the professions are different, although it's they also do have um, images of the practice developed either from their own experiences in religious settings, so that particularly in the clergy, there's quite strong uh, images of the kind of minister they want to be, for example, based on their home minister. So it's analogous, I would say. So what are the implications of you see um, One of the, you know, it's something we already do in teacher education is to spend a lot of time, in a, in a sense, making that apprenticeship of observation visible and open to scrutiny. Um, so we see more attention to that in teacher education than we saw autobiography. 
autobiography is one of the pedagogies that's just all over the place in teacher education. We didn't actually see it in the other professional education programs. And that's, I think, a response to the importance of personal biography and learning to teach. Um, but I think we might spend too much time there. I mean, I think the other thing is to give them stronger images of what it is that the practice really entails and opportunities to try it out. So I think we're sort of we're stuck in some ways in autobiography, and we need to move beyond that. They, right, I know, because it's not just decomposition, but recomposition of those pieces. And it is tricky. And again, part of it has to do with the kinds of approximations you offer over time so that they get closer and closer, I think, to authentic, what the authentic practice looks like, right? So that then they begin to practice leading the whole guided reading, for example, not just the pieces. Um, so I do think they need opportunities to practice that as well and to get feedback. Field experiences often where we say they're going to get that, but generally that's unsupported. So I think we need more opportunities. Right. And, and also the role of supervision, um, I think, is under-conceptualized in teacher education. Uh, supervision in clinical psychology is taken very, very seriously. And supervision in, in and of itself is seen as a model for therapy, so they, they really think about the role of the supervisor. Um, I don't think we spend as much time thinking about, again, the kind of feedback and support people need as they try these things out in classrooms and where we focus feedback at particular stages in development, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I think this notion of adapt, developing adaptive expertise in the setting is important. Um, but, it, but how do they develop that over time, right? Yeah, Rogers. I'm struck by the two comparative settings that you did choose and the one that you didn't uh, being medicine. Mm -hmm. There's so much to be written about that. But all three of them, then, the, the pastoral setting, as far as I understand it, the uh, uh, clinical psychology setting and the medical setting, the duration of training as an investment as a ratio to the return on investment that you can get from outcome studies must be very loaded in those other disciplines as well. How do they manage that when they're working with these students who are staying even longer in professional training and what's going on in a, in a pre-service? Yeah, this is one of the puzzles to me in this is how, you know, if part of the reason that we can't have longer programs of teacher education is the return on the investment in professional education being so limited, clergy don't make much more than teachers. Right? The, if anything, they make less. Right. It depends on where you go and which denomination I found out. There's big denominational differences. But, <laughs> but, but they're not making a lot more. And I don't think that actually therapists are making a lot more, depending on how successful they are, if they're working in a, clinic, in a setting, in a hospital setting, or if they have a private practice. Um, so I'm not sure of the answer to that question. I think the short answer is that we need a lot more teachers than we need clergy or clinical psychologists. One of the, I think, you know, it's just a question of scale. Is it possibly that the, it, it's not return on investment driven, but it is risk of doing harm driven? So the risk of doing harm in medicine, pastoral counseling, and clinical psychology is pretty dramatic by comparison with the risk of doing harm in teaching. I know you said that. <laughs> yeah, but most things are not, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that I think that's an interesting question about, you know, is it, what is it that helps account for those differences in length of training? It's really clear to me um, how having more time is an advantage. I mean, when we interview the first year, second year, I mean, you know, these people are spending considerably more time developing their practice than we typically, even if you think of an undergraduate program and you pick them up as sophomores, three years, you're not capturing all their time. They're doing lots of other things in that. 
Um, I, one interesting thing is the clergy is also suffering a problem of supply. And so one of the things that we got interested in is that there are now fast track programs into the clergy. <laughs> They're all alternative certification for the clergy. And <laughs> because they don't have enough people to fill the pulpits. <laughs> and so we were going to do a comparison of an alternative route teaching and alternative route clergy. I mean, they're taking lay people. It's very similar to some alternative routes in teaching. The demand is high and the supply is low. Um, so, and the average age of people in these seminaries has also gone up quite a bit. So people are choosing it as a second career, and there are a lot of people coming from other countries. So it's really, you know, there are some analogies to teaching here. Yeah. Well, I was reflecting on my own training, both as a teacher and then as a psychologist. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> See? <laughs> Within-person cross-professional <laughs> analysis. Yeah. You know, beyond sort of the length, I was thinking about the, how personal larger and the number of people who were in the class was much less personalized. And I wonder if that's part of the investment that people are willing to put into maybe becoming a clergy or becoming a, that there's, there's, it feels more intimate, almost vocational like or um, in the training as compared to the way often trained teachers. Although again, it depends because some of the programs were larger. Um, and some of the class sizes were about what we saw in teacher education. But I think the kind of supervision they got was much more personalized. Um, and they belong to supervisory groups that, again, stick together. And that's a big component of the curriculum. Um, so I think that, I, you know, I think there's that as well. You uh, made a comment earlier. Somebody else picked up on it a little bit later. Uh, recently, I was reading on uh, Claire Hernandez's work on using Japanese lesson studies with U.S. lady teachers. In one of her studies, she also had Japanese teachers that were doing it. What stuck out there was that uh, U.S. teachers were not willing to give each other critical feedback. And uh, uh, it, it looked so, so, so it didn't work. Because that's what the lesson study was all about. But for the Japanese teachers, apparently, uh, they didn't personalize it. it. The critique was of the lesson and the work. It wasn't of the person, per se. Right. And I'm just wondering, uh, as you look at this and you see this lack of, of critique uh, as a part of uh, learning to be a teacher, it, do you think that, that, that this is a product of teacher education, the, the teacher's lack of being able to or willing to critique each other because that's what they think teacher education is about, no criticism? I think there's a couple of different responses to that. Um, I just say it seemed pretty debilitating. Yeah. I, I've also, Sharon Feynman number, numbers their study of Chinese mentors and American mentors. Has, have people seen that work? The Chinese are very directive. They say, you should do this, 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 now do it, and now I'm going to tell you what you did wrong. And it's very, very direct, what we would be coding as directive feedback. Whereas the American, the American teachers saw that and they thought this was terrible, terrible mentoring. How could anybody do that? And their mentoring was, nice job. I really like how you're doing that. I think that's something you want to do more of. And the Chinese said, well, what's this? You know, this, is, this is a mentoring. You know? <laughs> so I, you know, I think there is a cultural um, issue in this country around teaching. Part of it is, again, it goes back to the personalization issue. One of the codes that we have is negotiating personal and professional. The other thing that's similar across these professions is the use of self. The self is an instrument of practice in all three of these professions. You can't get around it, right? You've got to be able to use yourself in certain ways. Um, in teaching, we, we, the way we've handled that is to say it's all a matter of personal style. You know, there's lots of ways to teach, and you should do, you know, what may, what feels good to you, and nobody's going to critique anybody else because it's very personal, and it, you know, it should be an expression of who you are. We don't hear that in the other professions. They're very clear on the role. There's a lot of discussion of the role, demands of the role, and expectations. So the separation of the, you know, it's still an issue in these other professions because 
dealing with the issues that come up in clinical psychology evokes all kinds of stuff for the therapist, and they're very explicit about dealing with issues of countertransference. It's right there in the classroom. But it's not, it's seen as a professional problem, right? And so I, I think there is this separation of person and role that we don't quite do in teaching. It's so much, you know, this issue of personal style. So do you see that as a goal? Could it be a goal of teacher education? I think to, to decouple that in some ways, yeah. I mean, I think being able to critique the work and not see that you're critiquing the person. Do you do that at Stanford? We try. <laughs> we try. I mean, what you didn't see is after I, uh, Lily videotaped that, her classroom, she actually brought that video back to my classroom. And she showed a clip um, that was really troubling her. And I told them, I said, I don't want you to bring in a clip that shows you at your finest. I want you to bring in a clip that really troubles you in some way, that puzzles you, you don't understand, you want help with. That's the purpose of showing video, not to have everybody say how good you are. And she brought in a clip where she thought that the students had fundamentally misunderstood the text and was wondering about her role in that. And, what do you, and it's a classic, again, it's a perfect dilemma in the teaching of literature. Right, is you want kids to develop their own interpretation, but how do you have the state have it remain grounded in text? Um, so I think we're trying, right? But I think in general, it's not something teacher education does well. And the danger of it is that when it tries to do that, it often turns to these blueprints and things, it's like the supervisor who comes in with the checklist to see how many times we did this, this, and this, and the other thing. But again, it's like it's time to theorize. Yeah, there you go. Right. Mm -hmm. yes. Do you think the uh, practicing of or, or enacting more within the training program would help propel um, professional communities of teachers, which I think are probably a lot stronger with those other two professions? I, that would be my guess, but I, I don't know if that's true. Do you think there's some transfer well, between the training and then once they get out there, then maybe they would be more open to sharing and providing more feedback on instruction. Well, again, therapists are told during training that, I mean, they're given a lot of experience giving each other feedback, and that's an explicit goal of the program is to teach them to give each other constructive feedback because the notion is someday they'll be supervising somebody else. Think cooperating teacher here. <laughs> and so they should know how to give feedback and be good at it. Um, but then they're also told that when they graduate, they should become a part of a consulting group and that there are problems of practice that they can't solve on their own and that part of their work involves being part of a larger consultation group that they can bring those problems to um, because they're going to be too close to it to be able to solve it themselves. So the kind of um, feedback, the kind of supervision they get is a model for what they're expected to do. So yes, there, I think there is a direct analogy. And again, in our own work on professional communities among teachers, this issue of feedback and people's willingness to really engage in any deep critique of practice was a real barrier to improvement. Yes? I was going to say about exploring there's a real culture of competition. And it, it causes the very best teachers not to become mentors and to hide their secrets and their magic tricks. And it takes an incredibly strong leader to change that to a culture of collaboration. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how you make the jump from the competition in class, pre-service classrooms, how you make that leap to the collaboration that you would like to see in a school. But again, and this is going a little further afield of my study, but again, part of it is professional socialization. To what extent are we socializing teachers to believe that they're responsible for the practice of their colleagues? I would say not very much, right? We really are not. Whereas in clinical psychology, that's really clearly part of their professional responsibility, and they address it. So, I mean, it helps you understand why nobody sees the teacher down the hall as their problem, right? Or why they would engage in that kind of discussion. So I think it does go back to the kinds of messages that we're sending in, in teacher education and professional education.
think it would be interesting to reanalyze work on professional community and see to what extent there are some clear frameworks around teaching and learning that are quite explicit. Um, either the habits of mind work and Debbie Mar I mean the CGI work has a very clear framework that decomposes that in, in essence maybe one of the ingredients you need is some agreement about sort of the nature of teaching and learning and what we're going to look at and what we're going to focus on as opposed to kind of a, a diffuse notion of we're going to we're going to improve classroom practice. And that's what I wanted to ask you about. If you went to different institutions that the director of your district here of clinical psychology is there agreement and where did that where did those agreements come from? What are they based on? Um, I think there's I think there's probably a lot more variability in the clergy again partly you know, there's different denominations. We're straddling different religions here. We're, you know, we're interested in what's common, but there's a lot of variability in what they might agree on as good. Even this question of what good effective preaching is is a matter of some debate across denominations. Or where the joints are. Or where the joints are. But in clinical psychology, there actually is a fair bit of agreement around that, and I think it's partly coming out of a press that we're experiencing as, as well as, you know, so why do you think this... You know, so they've developed different kinds of therapy. They have categories of therapy. And one of the reasons that we were interested in clinical psychology is like teaching, there's not a single model, right? So most of the schools that we were looking at had to think about how do you train people in kind of Rogerian therapy, um, uh, CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, which is effective for some things and not. You know, they had a range, just as we have, kind of a range of different approaches to teaching. Um, what's interesting is in teacher education, again, we think we have to choose one, right, and reject the others. In clinical psych, they actually think people have to be exposed to more than one um, and then specialize in one so that they know something about these variety. And then the schools differ on which ones they offer, mm -hmm. but most of them that we saw dealt with some of the controversy over it by you know, saying, well, there are different schools of thought about what might work. I think they've also spent a lot more time on issues of diagnosis and assessment than teaching has to get more common agreement around that. Yeah. In education, there's some scratching around going on about predispositions of good teaching. And it seems to me that in some ways you're trying to get down to the bottom of that and uh, identify them and, 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 and get at how do you Um, I don't know that we deal with dispositions so much, although dispositions are obviously a piece of this, as we, we're dealing with practices. Um, and one of, again, I think the things that diff teaching differs in. Um, so we saw courses, I mentioned one of the issues we're interested in is the negotiation of the personal and the professional. So we, we're seeing this across all three professions. How do you deal with, you know, as a clergy, actually, it's a very big issue because you go to the super, supermarket and everybody says, oh, well, there's our minister. Let's go up and ask a question. Um, you know, how do you have to conduct yourself in your personal life if you're that kind of figure within your religious community? One of the, we saw a class in um, that, again, addressed issues of disposition and identity uh, within teachers. One of the things that was striking about it is while it opened up this whole category and had people talk about their own backgrounds, talk about where they were coming from and how that might affect their ability to work in an urban school, it actually didn't go to the next stage of telling them what to do about this, right? Or how, what kinds of impact it would have on practice itself. So it raised a lot of issues, but it didn't take it anywhere. You know, at the end of class, we didn't know where it went. Whereas again, in these other professions, Clinical psychology is a really good example where there's a lot of attention to that because it matters. If a therapist has a hot spot, that's going to come out in the therapy, right? And they've got to figure out what their own role is in things when things go awry. So they've got to be very self-aware, and they cultivate self-knowledge. They make it an explicit priority. But then it's attached to these are the things you need to do, right? These are the ways you need to monitor yourself. These are the ways you need to back out when you realize that some. So it comes with something to do about it. And in teacher ed, we're, we're missing, I think we're missing that piece, right?
you can see we've been having fun.